So as another analogy, for a thousand pounds, that would be 16 ounces of water. Uh, also, as I mentioned, for a thousand pounds at the equator, uh, that would be two tablespoons of water as observed from the Apollo perspective. From a scientific perspective, the difference between the northern regions with this amount of water and the equatorial regions are truly astounding and are generating much scientific excitement. However, please keep this in mind that even the driest deserts in the earth have more water than are at the poles and the surfaces as we presented here of the moon. Currently, there are no complete explanations for this uh, phenomena. And I'm sure the observations from M cubed and other spacecraft in the next several years will continue to bring out more questions that need to be answered about this phenomena. And this will be studied for many years to come. And with that, Dwayne. Thank you all. Okay, what we're going to do, we're going to open up for questions, and we have a number of media on the phone line, so we'll go to the Ames Research Center, and then we'll take calls uh, on the phone line. So we will go out to Ames. Hi, uh, this is uh, Mike Swift, reporter with the San Jose Mercury News. Um, uh, the Elcross spacecraft is uh, scheduled to impact the moon on October 9th, I believe. Um, what more do you expect to learn from that mission in terms of either the quantity or the state of water in the polar regions of the moon? Uh, let me jump in here. Given these findings. Uh, this is Dwayne. We have uh, with us our exploration officials, so we're going to give them the mic and uh, identify yourself and can respond to that, please. Yeah. I'm Michael Wargo. I'm the chief lunar scientist for Exploration Systems, and uh, we're really excited about the results that we're hearing today, and uh, as the question indicated, we're conducting uh, an experiment on October 9th that uh, will look at uh, the potential for water in one of the permanently shadowed craters on the, the moon's south pole. One of the differences, though, is that the way in which we, we're going to be conducting that experiment is it's going to excavate the lunar surface, go through that upper surface and down on the order of a meter or so to look at uh, the potential distribution of water ice uh, and other volatiles uh, in the upper meter or two of the of the lunar surface. So, different kind of question uh, that we're that we're answering. And the 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 water question for the moon is a complex one. I think we're hearing that today. And just because there is water at the surface at the mid and high latitudes doesn't mean that it can't exist as water ice in the permanently shadowed regions. Uh, in fact, what we heard today was uh, a potential explanation for how the water gets into those permanently shadowed regions. So these are really complementary uh, experiments that are being done, and it shows how exploration enables science, and science enables exploration here. So uh, NASA together is moving forward on, the, uh, uh, on, on helping to answer the water question for the moon. Thank you, Mike. Uh, we're going to go to the phone lines now, and we have Clara from Space.com. Clara? Yes. Hi. Um, I was hoping you could talk a little bit more about theories for the origin of this water. Does the recent findings indicate more that the solar wind origin might be a better idea than cometary impacts? I can address this. This is Roger Clark. Um, I don't think so at this point. I mean, there's many uh, models out there, and probably to some degree they all are in, in play, and it's more a matter of working out what the proportions are. So, um, yeah, it's too early to tell. I think it's likely there won't, this is Robert Green, it's likely there will not just be a single mechanism, and that, uh, just to echo what Roger is, is saying. Okay, we'll now go to uh, Keith Cowan on the phone. Keith Cowan from NASAWatch.com. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, question. You have had two other space went by the moon making observations, one in November of 2008 and another way back in 1999. Given that you're treating both of these as being corroborative to the more recent data, 
why wasn't at least the information from uh, Deep Impact published or released to the public? Why did you sit on this or okay. uh, this is not just analyzed? The, and this most certainly, why any information uh, here not released back in 1999 or 2000? Well, let me start with Deep Impact, and I'll have Roger talk about uh, the NIMS data. He broke up so much. Please restate a question I think, that you sure. will answer. I think he was asking that uh, why, given that some of the Deep Impact data dates back to 2007 and the Cassini data dates back to 1999, haven't we been talking about it before? Uh, the answer for Deep Impact is that uh, in the data we collected in 2007 uh, was over the equator. And as you saw, it's an extremely weak feature. Uh, we weren't looking at it uh, for anything but calibration purposes, and it wasn't until after we actually recalibrated the instrument with the new 2009 data, which remember we took for calibration purposes, that we were able to go back and see that very weak feature in 2007, which is a long way of saying is we didn't know it until uh, very recently. In fact, it was the last thing that was added to the paper. Now, I'll let Roger answer Cassini. Okay. Cassini flew by the Earth in August 99 to do a gravity assist. We were able to turn on the spacecraft for a brief time to acquire data as we went by the moon, and in fact, we also intended it for calibration purposes. But we had no other calibration data until we were approaching Saturn in 2004 when we started uh, our looks at stars, and we also have a solar port, so we're looking at the sun. Every spacecraft that is launched from the Earth uh, when it's made in the lab, there's so much water around the Earth, and water is such a, a sticky molecule that it sticks to all the surfaces. So every spacecraft that's out there right now at the moment has water all over the spacecraft sticking to it. And spectrometers can see that, and it's a, quite a challenge to calibrate the spectrometers so we're not seeing water everywhere. So it took from 2004 through 2008 to acquire the data on Cassini to calibrate out the the uh, signatures of water. We were actually seeing stars with water in them, which we knew was not correct, and we traced it down to uh, the calibration of the instrument. And so it wasn't until last summer that uh, the calibration was good enough, and the first papers with this new calibration are, have been submitted only uh, starting in January. So it's really been a calibration issue. Okay, our next question is from Andrea Thompson from space.com. how it's thought that this water might sort of be mobile and, and move to the poles. I'm, I'm not sure I quite understand how that might work. Could you repeat the first part of your question again, please? Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, I, I was wondering if you could explain the, how you think that the, the water molecules are, are mobile and how they might be moving to the poles. I don't quite get how that would work. I, sure, I'll take a stab at this. Um, th this is one of the questions that we would like to have addressed as well. Um, uh, as you've seen, uh, this is an entirely new phenomena that has not been studied in great detail until we had conclusive evidence that it even existed. Um, some of the things we do not know is what is the relative proportion of uh, water and hydroxyl. Um, we have very strong indications that some of this is time varying, both in the M-cube data and the deep impact data, but we don't know in what way it's varying. Is it mobile or is it being created and destroyed on a rapid manner? We simply do not know these issues. It's intriguing, and we certainly want to go back and try to identify what is needed to address those very questions. We have to understand the physics of this silicate surface and the vacuum around it, which is a wash with solar wind particles, um, micrometeorites. This is an environment and interface that we know very little about. And the physics is just in its infancy. Well, I can address a little more mm -hmm. on that. Uh, this phenomenon is actually observed a couple of places in the solar system. Um, basically, the idea is that uh, where it's hot, water molecules will tend to evaporate and gravity, they'll fly off the surface and gravity will pull them back down. So they're, the molecules are hopping around if they're not swept away by a magnetic field or solar wind or something. So where it's colder, the molecules will stick longer. So as the molecules bounce around, when it gets to the cold polar regions, they'll stay there. We observe uh, a frost buildup 
on uh, satellite of Jupiter, Ganymede. That, uh, Voyager got some very nice pictures of those. Uh, the